Now let's talk about the law of conservation of mass. And in a non-nuclear process, mass is neither created nor destroyed. That is the uh, one statement of the law of conservation of mass. And let's say a couple words about a non-nuclear process. In a non-nuclear process, no nuclei are created nor destroyed, which anyway, so no, so, um, so we're talking about no nuclear power plants. Because a nuclear power plant would be a nuclear process. Or nuclear bombs. And there are other nuclear processes as well, uh, some of which make things like um, uh, nuclear medicines as well. And that's actually really interesting too. But all those break nuclei apart. We're not doing that. We're uh, keeping our nuclei together for this portion. And uh, the law of conservation of mass, and so all of chemistry, essentially, is non-nuclear processes. So now let's talk about chemistry for a minute. In chemical reactions, and I've got my abbreviation for reactions here, there must be the same number of each type of atom on the reactant and product sides of the reaction. And so as an example of that, let's talk about hydrogen peroxide that you can buy at your local pharmacy. So hydrogen peroxide, the formula is H2O2, that's hydrogen peroxide, and H2O2, hydrogen peroxide, is aqueous. And what aqueous means, and let me just write that out, aqueous equals uh, a Q U E O U S, aqueous. And what it means is dissolved in water. Dissolved in water. Okay? So the peroxide that you get is dissolved in water. Oftentimes, uh, when I buy it, I get a 3% hydrogen peroxide solution, which means that approximately 97% of it is water already. But that hydrogen peroxide, it is a cleaning agent, an antiseptic, you might say. And uh, if you take two hydrogen peroxides, they react to form two waters. And oxygen, which is truly the antiseptic agent. And uh, some more terminology here, if I can find my other pen. Uh, well, looks like I'm going one color today. Uh, is going to be uh, on the left of the arrow. This is the reactant side of the chemical reaction. And the right is the product side. So there are two products. Now, I really do want to find this pen. Um, I'm not going to be able to, though, so I will go get another pen. It's going to have to be red. Let's add up the number of hydrogens on the left-hand side, the reactant side. We have 2 times 2. That's, uh, let's draw a little line here. We have 4 hydrogens, 4 H's, 2 times 2. We have two times two, that's four oxygens. Four O's there. On the product side, we have two times two, that's four hydrogens as well. And we have two times one. And we could put a one here, it's implied. One times two, so we have two O plus two O's for four oxygens. And so that's how chemical reactions work. And you can see that mass has been conserved. That's how chemical reactions work. Now, the next thing we want to talk about is what's called a mass balance. And an English description of a mass balance is the mass at the beginning of the process must equal the mass at the end of the process. And we can put that in equation form. And another way of saying it is mass in equals mass out. And this assumes that there's no accumulation, which we will assume. It's a good assumption for a lot of things. 
Now, the next term that I want to discuss is what's called a process flow diagram. And this is a diagram that shows all the inputs and outputs for a process. And each of them has an arrow showing its direction, so you can tell which is which. And it also includes named processes, and you'll see that we'll go through several named processes as simple as a washer and a dryer. And it's a way of drawing the conservation of mass so that you think about not only what goes in, but what goes out. And those inputs and outputs are clear. But before we go and uh, do some examples, let's talk about more about what a unit operation is. Uh, a definition, or a working definition, is that it's any step in a process where a chemical or physical change takes place. Sorry, that back snuck in there. Takes place. Now, let's define chemical and physical change before we move on. So, B, chemical change. is any change that involves a chemical reaction. And oftentimes, in chemistry classes and other classes, a chemical change is obvious because, as an example, we write it as a reaction. Hydrogen peroxide aqueous goes to water that is a liquid plus oxygen gas. That is definitely a chemical change. Another chemical change in which we don't give a reaction, but something's definitely going on, is when milk spoils. Reactions here are pretty complex and involved bacteria eating sugars in milk and creating stinky products. That's more of a biology version of um, a chemical change. And uh, I'm sure they could give you re reactions for that. But I will point out, oh, I shouldn't make that an arrow, that when milk spoils, there is a um, change in smell. Change in smell, change in taste. And that changes in smell and changes in taste are oftentimes good ways to recognize chemical reactions. And I've got here, when I was doing the videos for the activity, I've got my coffee that I made. Ah, oh, smells so delicious. And it definitely smells different than the beans that I started with. So that's a sign that chemical reactions have occurred during the roasting process. Now let's talk about physical changes or what a physical change is. A physical change, well, let's define it by what it's not, is any change that does not involve a chemical reaction. And I'm gonna use the abbreviation for reaction RxN. And so now let's talk about some examples of this. So. One example would be ice melting. When ice melts, you start with H2O solid, that's ice. You end with, so start, end, H2O liquid, which is water. And this is not a chemical reaction. This is a physical change. This is not a chemical change because you can see that the H2O, no bonds have been broken, nothing has happened. You still have the same thing at the end. And this is a definition of a physical change. It's also called a phase change. But it is not a chemical reaction. Sometimes in chemistry classes, we might write it as a chemical reaction, but it is not. I know that's confusing. <clears throat> okay. Another example, one that's particularly pertinent to us, is filtering coffee.
we start with coffee, beans, and water mixed together. Coffee, beans, and I guess coffee mixed. Um, and we end with, uh, so coffee, beans, in one place, in filter, and coffee in cup. At least when I usually make it. Oh, sorry, that lost off the page there. Coffee in cup. While you're here, right next to the four Roman numeral, please draw a smiley face. Now let's talk about a uh, simple process flow diagram for washing clothes. And in this, we're going to have a unit operation that is a washer. And a washer mixes and separates. And if you've ever seen how a high efficiency washer separates, it's actually pretty brilliant. It's like this chemistry instrument we have called a centrifuge and it spins so quickly that the water is just pulled through the filter, right? It's got holes in it. It's like a giant colander. And uh, the water flows through, leaving behind relatively dry but still wet clothes. All right, inputs. And the inputs are usually put on the left-hand side or the top, up to you. Uh, First is going to be dirty clothes. And water. And from there, you can put a variety of chemicals in there to help you wash your clothes, though those chemicals are essentially not doing chemical reactions. It's going to be physical changes. They're going to dissolve things. Um, they're not going to break bonds, per se. But let's just say we use detergent. Some people also use bleach. Some people also use fabric softener. You could have a variety of inputs here, but we'll just put it all under the category of detergent since this is a simple process flow diagram. And the things that we get out, we get out clean, wet laundry. And we get out and put it out the bottom here, gray water. And that gray water is going to include uh, the detergent and the dirt. And I think that's pretty much everything. Now, what we're going to do on the last thing on this page is we're going to write a mass balance. For this process and the mass balance is going to say that uh, mass in equals mass out and we're going to have mass of dirty clothes so we're going to be m which is still a lowercase m i know i made it a little big of uh, dc for dirty clothes plus mass of our water plus mass of our detergent. Those are all our inputs to the washer. And then we're going to have mass of clean, wet laundry, CWL, plus mass of our gray water. And what's nice is if you know the mass of all of these things except say the mass of your gray water. Let's say you could record the mass of all of them because right, you know how much detergent you put in. Uh, you could, in theory, figure out how much water and you know your mass of your dirty clothes. You can weigh your laundry at the end there, figure out how much uh, gray water you're giving out. 
So that's a simple example of a process flow diagram with a mass balance as well. You can do another one for drying clothes, in which case the unit operation, and this time I'm going to just write unit op for operation as our dryer. And now from our, oop, there we go, from our washer we get clean wet laundry. And basically we have air that the dryer takes in. And the dryer heats the air. It uh, mixes the clothes. And then in the end, it filters the air, as mine does. And I think it was pretty common. Uh, and that's how it collects lint and the outputs, other outputs are going to be uh, clean dry laundry. And hot moist air. Like so. And so it's, uh, we could be more detailed than this. We could do more unit operations. We could break this one unit operation of a dryer into a part that heats, a part that mixes, and a part that filters air. So this could be more complex. But the level that we want to do it for this class and the level that we're going to be doing it for coffee roasting is we're going to look at one unit operation at a time, what goes in and what comes out, and then we're going to measure the things. And we could do a mass balance for this one as well. Now it's time for you to try it. I want you to think of a mass balance for the unit operation of either a pet, you would write cat or dog or uh, gecko, if you have a gecko or a hamster, or for a plant, if you're perhaps a biology major or more biologically inclined, what does a plant take in? What does a plant give off? What does a pet take in? What does a pet give off? Do your best. I'll be looking for this for some of the points for your grade. And finally, a process flow diagram for roasting coffee. And it looks like I need a couple pages underneath here to support this. Um, and this time our unit, our, uh, our unit operation is gonna be a popcorn popper, which we could also call a roaster, but it is a popcorn popper. And the popcorn popper heats, swirls um, the beans, heats and swirls. And we will attempt to at least motivate the idea that there are also reactions, chemical reactions going on in there that create gases. And so uh, this time our unit operation is going to take in uh, green coffee beans. And it's gonna take in air. And what it's gonna give off are, or what we're gonna get out of it, our outputs, if you will, are going to be roasted coffee beans. Uh, we're going to get uh, air out as well. We're going to get chaff, and you'll see the chaff. Chaff is going to be this skin-like material that comes off of the outside of the uh, beans while it roasts, while it pops, actually. And then we're also going to have gases given off. And uh, we are going to do a mass balance for this. It is going to, that's why we're doing this, is to learn about the law of conservation of mass. And I'll tell you that the air that goes in and the air that goes out, first off, air does have mass. And so we'll call this air in and air out. And we're going to assume that the air in mass and the air out mass are the same, they're equal to each other, so we won't write them in our 
roasting coffee mass balance. We'll focus on the fact that there are green coffee beans in our mass balance. And I'm going to call this M green, just like I do in the activity. That's the only thing that goes in other than the air. And we're going to have our mass of our roasted coffee beans. So we have green, we have roasted. Plus the mass of our chaff, which we will measure. And then uh, we won't be able to measure the mass of our gas, the gases that are created due to a chemical reaction, chemical reactions, many of them actually. But we will measure using a balance, the mass of our uh, green coffee beans, the mass of our roasted coffee beans. We'll do a reasonably good job of measuring the mass of our chaff. And then because we know all of these, we'll be able to subtract and do algebra and find the mass of the gases that are created during this process. And that's a little bit of information about what's going on in this week's activity and a little background material.